and we will get started. So I thought at first it would be helpful to just talk about, well, why does documentation matter? Uh, and it matters in part because that is our mission. Uh, the mission of the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office is to carry out the mandates of the National Historic Preservation Act in Oklahoma in partnership with the National Park Service and local governments. We work with citizens and groups throughout the state to identify, evaluate, and protect historic architectural and archaeological resources. And oftentimes when we think about preservation, we think of preserving a building in place in perpetuity. Um, but preservation does not necessarily mean that that resource will remain in place or as built. And so research, photographs, drawings, narrative histories, um, those all, and that's just a, you know, a small sample of just the variety of, 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 of things that can fall under the realm of preservation work. At the root of all of that is the identification and documentation of historic properties. Uh, that, goes that goes toward fulfilling a number of our program area areas, whether it's review and compliance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, the National Register of Historic Places, state and federal tax credits, um, or any comprehensive planning or, and, and partnerships with the variety of our um, the partners throughout the state, federal, tribal, state, county, and municipal partners. So what is Historic Preservation Resource Identification, or that handy acronym HPRI? It is the process of surveying and recording historic buildings, structures, objects, sites, or districts. And anyone can conduct HPRI. We receive HPRI forms from a variety of individuals or groups who are interested in a particular resource. Um, and the majority of our data is accumulated through forms submitted in compliance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act or through survey projects funded through subgrant and contract arrangements with our office. And so for those reasons, HPRI is conducted throughout the year. It is an ongoing process. I review forms daily, pretty much, in my, in my position. And so where are these completed forms kept? All this data is accumulated in what we call the Oklahoma Landmarks Inventory, or OLI. Access to the OLI database is available online. Uh, we also maintain uh, hard copies of, of our HPRI forms and photographs and, and associated documentation, and the public can access those records by visiting um, our office during regular business hours. Uh, do keep in mind that access to certain types of records, such as archaeological sites, is limited. Really briefly, how to access the form. Uh, perhaps the easiest way to do so is by contacting our office directly. It's a PDF form. I'm happy to you know, provide it to you via email. That way it's easy for you to fill out. Um, the form is, it's, as I mentioned, it's a PDF form. You can fill it out using um, basic Adobe Acrobat software. If you want to try to track down the form uh, through our office, um, I've provided a few screenshots here for you to, to, to get to it. So if you visit our you know, our webpage, the State Historic Preservation Office, we're under the Oklahoma Historical Society's um, website. So www.okhistory.org backslash SHPO. Click on the consultant tabs to, to the left. That takes you to this webpage here. You see to the left, you can click on forms. And then if you click on forms, that gets you to the variety of forms that we use in um, our day-to-day -day work. I uh, have highlighted an arrow the uh, Historic Preservation Resource Identification Form. You can click on that link to the PDF and you can download the form directly. We also have a form for uh, cemeteries. And we also have forms for um, documenting bridges as well. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm focusing exclusively on the Historic Preservation Resource Identification Form because that's the form we mo that I most commonly use uh, for, for my review work. Generally speaking, this is how a this is how the blank form looks. Uh, the form itself is two pages. It can expand to three pages or longer, depending on the amount of documentation that's necessary. So from here, just to want to provide a step-by-step -step process of, of, of 
what we need in each of these fields. As you see there, there's 56 fields. We don't necessarily need all 56 fields entered in for purposes of our review, depending on what the project is. Uh, so I am going to just, but I will provide just a step-by-step -step review of what we need in each of these uh, fields or what these fields um, expect. So let's start with the first six. Um, property name, um, that is you can insert the property name or type um, or if you're, this is a project that's associated with a particular survey or construction project, you can indicate the project name there. Um, after that, resource name. Resource name is the name of the individual building, structure, object, um, or site. Um, so whether it's a, a named building, um, you know, a school, um, a single family residence, that's, you know, that's where that information goes. For address, we need the street address. In most cases, that's you can easily find that information. Or if it's a, a more rural property, um, you know, please provide available directional information um, to the best of your ability. Um, for city, you know, en enter the nearest city or town. If the town is within city limits, you can leave the vicinity field blank. Um, if the resource is located outside of city limits, you can indicate V uh, under the vicinity field. And that just gives us an idea about, well, is this resource located within city limits or outside city limits, that's that type of thing. Uh, and then for county name, uh, county, that, that's a drop down menu. You can you know, select the drop down menu and select the county that the resource is limited. So you can see here on the you know, upper right, the blank form, you know, bottom right is you know, a, a sample form with these fields indicated. So we know we're working with a house. It's a single family residence. We have the address, we have the city, uh, you know, the town or city that's in the vicinity of that town or city and the county. The next set of information is uh, the location information. We have several different options to, to look at here. And as I note here, I need at least one of the following sections completed. More often than not, you know, these forms that we receive have at least two of the following sections completed. Um, if the property is within city limits, you can provide the lot block and plat name. Uh, that's particularly helpful if I need to track down, say, like a Sanborn map or additional information to try to track down the history of that property. Section township range. Um, the most common data that we receive is latitude, uh, longitude data, uh, you know, latitude north and longitude west. Um, more often not best because, you know, we all have, most of us have cell phones. You can get that information pretty much instantly using a, a map uh, software. And you can also provide UTM zone northings and eastings. After that, we have the resource type. And again, this is, you can select from a drop down menu and simply select one of the following. Is the resource a building? You know, is it meant to house human activities? Is it a structure such as a bridge? Is it an object, a site, or a district? Or in the event that there's no data, you can enter in no data. And then same thing for historic and current functions. We have a series of, you, know, you can choose from the drop down menu. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, we're looking at the form that we're filling out here, it's for a house. So historically the house functioned as a single family dwelling. So there's an option for single dwelling. And if it's still functioning as, as we can see, it's also still functioning as a dwelling. So single dwelling is the current function. If you're documenting say like a school building, um, there's, a, there's an option for historic function. You can select education. If the building is currently um, vacant or not in use, there's an option that you can select for that in the drop down menu for current function. So there's a wealth of information that you can choose from. Just pick the option that you think best fits um, the property type. Next, we get into um, significance. Um, Area of significance, primary and secondary. So primary area of significance, this is the most important area of significance. And again, this is an editable, editable PDF. These are, we have drop down menus for you to uh, pick from. So indicate uh, the primary area of significance to the best of your ability. If you think there's also a secondary area of significance, such as, you know, this is the next most important area of significance. If one exists, you can put that as well. So for the former filling out for this single family residence, um, area of primary significance is indicated as, as agriculture, which tells us this is a, you know, a rural farmhouse, perhaps. Um, area of significant secondary was also indicated as, as agriculture. Now that's fine, or since it's already indicated as the primary area of significance, we don't necessarily need that field entered in. Um, description of significance, 
basically briefly state the significance and potential eligibility of the resource in question. Uh, by eligibility, we mean National Register uh, eligibility. So try to keep this to two to three sentences. This could be something as simple as what we have on the form here, not individually eligible, um, or perhaps it's uh, individually eligible for the National Register um, for agriculture or for ethnic heritage or education. Um, maybe it's contributing to a historic district. That's where you would indicate that, in, that information. Um, documentation of resource. This is where you would list um, those sources used for documenting the resource and its significance. Um, so like what we have here, uh, the main documentation that was used was county assessor rec records for, for major county. Um, oftentimes what we also see cited here is um, historic aerial photographs, um, Sanborn fire insurance maps, um, you know, the property deed or abstract. Um, those are the types of things. Just a basic, simple list of, of those sources that were used uh, to document the, the resource. It does not have to be comprehensive, but you know, provide the, you know, what were those most important sources that were used. Um, following that, it's pretty straightforward. We need your name, you know, who's prepared the form. Um, is it associated with a survey project? Um, if, if so, then enter yes. Um, and then also enter in that survey project name, you know, whether it's a project associated with um, a replacement of a highway bridge or it's a, associated with an architectural survey of a particular neighborhood. Um, if you're, you know, someone who's preparing this form and you're just interested in, you know, learning whether or not this one particular building is eligible, and it's not necessarily part of a survey project, you can just enter in no uh, for, that, for that entry. Date, of, uh, date of preparation, you know, please enter the month and year that the form was prepared. Uh, please indicate uh, whether photographs are included with your form and the year that those photographs were taken. And please note that an HPRI form is incomplete without photographs. And I'll talk about, briefly talk about what photographs we need here towards the end. Moving on to page two, uh, we start first with architect and builder. Uh, so if you know the architect uh, and or builder of the property, please indicate that in that field. If you don't know the architect and builder, that's okay. You can simply put unknown. Uh, similar thing for year built, please indicate the date of construction or the approximate date of construction. You can see with the form that, we've, that we're filling out, the year built is indicated as circa 1930. Um, so don't know exactly that when it was built, but we do know it was built around 1930. So please enter the date of construction. And you can obtain that information from county tax records, uh, city records, aerial photographs, um, or Sanborn maps. Original site, this is sometimes a, a, a part of the form that throws people off. Basically, we're wondering, is the resource located where it was originally built and where the historic significance occurred? And simply indicate yes or no. If the pro if the property is ha is in its original site, indicate yes. You can kind of you can move on. If it's if it's not in its original site, indicate no. And then in the following fields, indicate you know when was it moved and from where will it, you know where was it moved, where was it located previously. If the site hasn't been moved, you don't you can enter an NA for those fields or just leave them blank. Um, Architectural style, um, we have a drop-down menu for, for, the, for these fields to, to help folks out with this. Uh, we also have a preliminary opinion manual that can provide some guidance that you know, provides, outlines some of the more, the more notable architectural styles that we have here in Oklahoma. Um, you know, select the arch architectural style that you think best um, fits the, the property. Um, there's a number of other uh, resources and style guides that you can use to try to, to pinpoint um, architectural style. Again, use the best of your ability because, of course, oftentimes style is in the eye of the beholder. So, uh, but again, use, uh, use your best judgment, um, or you can also reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, then we get into materials and features of the particular resource, and this is geared mainly towards uh, buildings. And so foundation material, you know, select the primary foundation material from the drop down menu. You know, is it a, does it have a stone foundation, brick foundation, concrete foundation? Um, you can, for, for this field and for any of the following fields, you can enter in uncollected if that particular feature um, or material is not visible 
uh, or obscured from view. So for roof type and roof material, um, again, you can enter the roof type. You know, is it a gabled roof? Is it hipped roof, um, pyramid roof, um, flat roof? Again, you can refer to the preliminary opinion manual for guidance. And again, select the existing roofing material from the drop the drop down menu. Is it asphalt shingle, um, tile? You know, what's you know, select the the roofing material from that drop down menu. And again, if you can't see the roof, you can enter in on collected. Primary and secondary wall materials. So that's we're referring to the exterior wall materials. So is it does it have a brick exterior, vinyl exterior? Is it a combination of both? Um, you know, enter in the primary and secondary exterior wall materials. Window type of material. Here we're looking for uh, the window style and configuration, as well as the material of the window sash. So are these? So as you can see from the form that we're working on, you know. We documented a one over one, one over one hung windows as the most common window type you could enter in if it's a six over six hung window. Um, is it casement windows, awning windows? Again, you can refer to our preliminary, preliminary opinion manual guide um, for, for, for some guidance. In terms of window material, we're again, we're looking for the material of the window sash. So essentially, is it wood framed, steel framed? Um, what's the material of the window sash? Door type of material, um, the most common door types uh, that we come across are paneled, glazed paneled slab, and glazed slab. So those are the most common types that we see, but basically indicate the, the most common door type and the material, you know, wood, metal. If windows and doors are boarded or obscured from view, you can enter in um, uncollected. And then lastly, exterior, interior features, decorative details. Please enter and you know, indicate any character defining features and any special unique decorations present. It can be as simple as what we have here for the completed form, front gable porch, um, and it can be just, it can be as simple as that. Last part of the form, uh, so condition of resource. Uh, what condition is the resource in? Again, we have a drop down menu for this, and you can select from the following excellent, good, fair, poor, or ruins. Use your best judgment uh, to, in, to, to indicate the condition. In terms of description of resource, this is where you briefly describe the resource's appearance, including any alterations. If you can confirm the date that those alterations occurred, please indicate that. And you can also provide additional information under uh, field number 56 or the continuation. And that is a part of the form that it can expand to accommodate as much information as you feel that you need to provide. Um, and so for the description of resource that we have for our, our completed form is very brief. It's described as a two-story house with central entry, entry flanked by single windows on second story large addition to the rear of the house. Um, for field number 52 comments, you can include any general comments um, about uh, the resource. You know, maybe is there an outbuilding on, on site or you know, a storage shed nearby, something like that. Um, number 53, attached location map. Um, I'll talk about that here in a little bit, but Typically, our forms need to be accompanied by a map that indicates nearby major uh, and adjacent references, such as road and street names. And that map should indicate the resource's location in relation to those reference points. And similar to photographs, um, a form is not complete unless we have a map to go along with it. We need to know where these resources are. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we, we want to know whether the property is listed on the National Register. If you know it's been listed on the National Register, you can indicate yes, and then in the field below, indicate the uh, National Register ID number. If the property is not listed, you can enter no, uh, and it's as simple as that. And then lastly, the continuation for the continuation entry, um, you can continue from any numbered item. Uh, please provide any, any additional information that you feel has not been covered by any of the previously numbered items in that continuation field, uh, whether it's a chronology of the buildings, you know, chronology of the buildings changes over time, uh, history of the property, um, any information like that that you think can help facilitate our review um, of that particular resource. So again, you know, here's we started out with a blank form, and then after all of that, uh, here is what we what we have left is so we have you know the form filled out i mean note that not every field is is entered in 
that's okay. But with this information, we have a good general idea of, of the resource type. You know, it's a building uh, located in a major county. Um, you know, it's of the national folk architectural style. It's a cross gable roof, you know, those types of things. We have just some basic information that we can use to assess uh, the property's condition and uh, historic integrity. Briefly, uh, in regards to maps, um, so I mentioned earlier, a form is not, or a, uh, sorry, a form is not complete without a map. Uh, so typically, we need um, at least a close-up, large-scale aerial image depicting the documented property and nearby features, such as street names or other prominent buildings. So I have a sample of uh, a sample map showing the our office at the Oklahoma History Center um, as an example. You can see it's you know, the most prominent streets nearby are Northeast 23rd Street and North Lincoln Boulevard. We can clearly see uh, other notable landmarks nearby, like the State Capitol building and things like that. We have a map that's clearly labeled, indicates the building in question here, in this case, the History Center. Um, and note that these map, this mapping software is easily available. Um, you can use uh, software such as Google Earth or ArcGIS Expl Explorer, and you can simply dis capture the desired image from that software, paste it into a photo editing program or document, and label it accordingly. And then the last thing in terms of photographs, a uh, common question I get um, from folks is, you know, how many photographs do you need uh, to do a review of a property, whether it's for Section 106 review or a request for preliminary opinion of eligibility? And the answer is, it depends on the size and complexity of the property. Um, for buildings, uh, we need to include, I need to see at least one or more views that show the facade and other elevations. Uh, here are photographs from a recent survey of, uh, of cabins at Beavers Bend State Park. And you can see what we provided here is, is photographs that show all the major elevations. So from those three photographs, I have a clear idea of, of you know, the building type, key exterior materials, windows, doors, you know, any exterior features or decorative details from those three photographs, I can get a pretty good idea of how this building is put together. One thing you can also provide is uh, prints of historic photographs. Uh, you can use any type of historic material, uh, historic documentation, such as photographs or newspaper articles that you think might um, supplement the documentation and help facilitate our review. And so with that, um, that's all that I have. Um, again, kind of a crash course in filling out the form. Um, and I think from here, I will transfer things over to uh, Christina, who will talk about site forms. Thank you, Matt. Uh, and uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. I've noticed that some of your questions are showing up in, on our end in the Q&A, and we will address those at the end of the presentation. I also wanted to draw your attention to the handouts tab. There are a number of handouts that Matt has provided. They have a little house emblem next to them to indicate that those are related to the HPRI forms. And then I have included some attach some handouts with a little trowel icon next to them that are uh, related to the archaeological uh, site form. So if you thank you, Matt. Um, so if you wanted to jump over there into the handouts tab and either view or download those, now would be a great time. I am going to speak for just a few minutes on how to complete site forms for our office, the State Historic Preservation Office's review. So uh, as a reminder, I review post-contact archeological resources and the Oklahoma Archeological Survey reviews pre-contact archeological resources. And I am not going to speak on anything that they need from you. So you'd wanna contact their office uh, for that information. What I'm going to do in this presentation is I've created an annotated site form, and I'm just going to go through that form uh, half a page at a time uh, to highlight what I've added and the information that I need. So this is the first page. Um, actually, I'm going to pull my camera off so you can see better. This is the first page of the archaeological site form. And at the top, uh, the links are, this, this is a PDF, so you can't click from the image here, but on if you download the annotated site form 
anywhere it says click here, that is an active link. So if you click the top, that link will take you to the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey's website where their forms are hosted, including this form, the Archaeological Site Survey form. I've noted if you are going to do an update to a site form, you should still be filling out this form in most cases, and then you would want to indicate in the drop down box that your form is an update. Um, sometimes people ask about the field code. That's an internal project identifier. So that comes from you, whoever is completing this form, how you're identifying the archaeological site prior to it receiving a site trinomial, which is requested from the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey. I've included a couple of little helpful hints for UTMs. Keep in mind that the northing is the seven digit number and the easting is the six digit number. If you get those mixed up, it can confuse things. And then keep in mind also when you're looking at the legal description, the quarter, quarter, quarter sections would be red. Quarter section uh, or the northwest, for instance, quarter of the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter. So as they're entered in those boxes, that's the way that you are reading that. Let's see, I will move to the bottom half of this page and just note that make sure you are providing clear directions for how to access the archeological site and make sure that those directions begin at a clearly defined location, such as an intersection or a landmark. A lot of the requested information in this site form is pretty intuitive and I'm not gonna go through every single item here unless you indicate a question at the end and we will definitely address that. But I just wanna hit some highlights. So again, I have included some annotations in this form and hopefully that will help you as you're filling this out. On the second page, under number five, cultural affiliation, please note that there are two boxes for uh, post-contact archaeological sites. One says protohistoric slash historic Indian, and the other says historic non-Indian. A lot of times people who have not done any archival research will indicate historic non-Indian, but that's not really accurate. If you don't know, you can mark both of these or you could mark neither. Uh, regardless, you need to be clear what you know and where you have re where that information is coming from in your site description in number 23. So this is the bottom half of that page. Keep in mind there are brief spaces under each of these five and six to provide some information about where you know how you know the cultural affiliation and the historic phase. Please do include that information here but elaborate, provide more specific information under the site description. The historic site range, number seven, uh, gives these periods of time. If you know when the site was occupied based on maps and aerials, et cetera, or archival research, that information needs to be in the site description, but please use this section to indicate the most applicable time period for your site. And under number eight, keep in mind that this indicates this question asks for all applicable answers. Okay, so then uh, under number 10, the description of cultural material. Please do summarize the cultural material from the site. List the artifact types and, and provide numbers for each type and note any diagnostic artifacts and the dates or date ranges that are applicable to them. The cultural material that you're discussing here and should be discussing here should also be discussed in your site description under number 23. And please keep in mind that photographs are important, an important part of site forms. And especially if you're not doing any collecting, which has become quite common, if you're not collecting anything from the archeological site, 
then the photographs and the descriptions are all that remains of this resource or the only thing perhaps that future archaeologists and researchers will have. Okay, so then jumping to the fifth page, um, note that the current land use is current at the time you're documenting this site. How is the land being used? Also note under 15, this is ground surface visibility rather than vegetation coverage. And then number 16, physiographic divisions. I've included a link here to the Oklahoma Almanac. So you can click there and view the map and hopefully that will help some of you out. Likewise, on the following page for soils, I've, include a I've included a couple of links, one to the USDA Web Soil Survey and the other to soil web applications. So if you do not have these resources currently, uh, hopefully that's helpful. And again, under 21 Natural Vegetation, there is a, a map for a Bruce Hoagland map from 2008, and uh, that's hosted on the Geological Surveys website. I've provided a link to that resource here. Keep in mind that the site area, uh, the form just allows you to enter a number. Be sure that your number is in square meters. Okay, for site description, I've put some information under this um, section to try and flesh out what we need to see in this portion, what I need to see. So please do provide the site dimensions and give them in relation to a known point, uh, such as a landmark, or if there isn't a good landmark, you could use coordinates. Make sure those coordinates are defined and also illustrate them on your sketch map. Indicate how the site was identified and how the site boundaries or dimensions were determined. If you are doing this as part of a Section 106 review, indicate the site's location in relation to the project's area of potential effect. Describe what the site represents. Is it a town site? Is it a farmstead, a battlefield, et cetera? and indicate when the site was occupied or in use, and also provide here references for that information. Identify and describe all the site features and include what each feature represents, its size, its relation within the site, and or its relation to other site features. Discuss the artifacts at the site. Include a representative summary of the artifacts and describe and discuss diagnostic artifacts and discuss the nature of the artifact deposits. Discuss the site context derived from historical maps, aerials, newspapers, deed research, uh, other archival records, personal communication. And if you're using personal communication, please do indicate the source of that communication. I'm gonna to switch to the next one so you can see the bottom here. The, and this last request is for names of property owners associated with the site occupation and use. For example, the patent recipient or a lottie or any identified property owners, uh, chain of title information, et cetera, and include other references to archival data when applicable. So if you've done the work to find more information about the persons associated with this site, then document that information here. For subsurface testing, indicate what the subsurface, what subsurface testing was conducted. If there were shovel tests excavated, say how many and how many of those tests were positive and attach a shovel test log to document the positive tests at least. 
indicate how the testing locations were determined and describe the soils identified in the excavated shovel tests. Briefly summarize what, if any, subsurface artifacts or features were identified and state any other subsurface investigations like geophysical and briefly summarize those results. This is the bottom half of page eight, and then I'm moving over to page nine. And under statement of site integrity, I really wanna emphasize this one. Note that site significance and site integrity are separate questions. And determining site integrity is actually the final step in the National Register evaluation process. Uh, quote, integrity should not be used as an initial step with which to screen properties. Um, I've actually included a link to the National Register Bulletin number 36 here. So you can reference that uh, at any time when you're looking at this annotated site form. Uh, so I've reiterated the, natu the National Register evaluation process. First, you categorize the property. Second, you determine the historic context the property represents. Third, you determine whether the property is significant under the National Register criteria. And fourth, you determine if the property represents a type usually excluded from the National Register. And then finally, number five, you determine whether the property retains integrity. And I've just summarized here, let me switch to the next page, um, that under criterion A, integrity is implying well-preserved features, artifacts, and intrasite patterning illustrating an event or pattern of events. Under criterion B, integrity uh, is sufficient uh, or sufficient integrity implies the essential physical features or setting during the site's association with the relevant important person's life is intact. Under criterion C, sufficient integrity requires well-preserved remains that clearly illustrate design and construction. And then there are five steps in a criterion D evaluation. One, identify the property's data sets or categories of archeological, historical, or ecological information. Two, identify the appropriate historical and archeological framework in which to evaluate the property. Three, identify the important research questions the property's data sets can be expected to address. Four, uh, archeological integrity, Evaluate the data sets for known or potential ability to answer research questions. And five, identify what important information the site has yielded or is likely to yield. And a lot of this information is reiterated in my annotation under number 30, Statement of Site Significance. I've included a link here also to the National Register Bulletin. Um, and I've noted that in the evaluation process, um, or I've reiterated the evaluation process and then noted under criteria A, you would need to identify events with which the property is associated. You would need to document the importance of the events within the broad pattern of history. Then three, you would demonstrate the strength of association of the property to those events under criteria B, you would identify the important persons associated with the site, then discuss the importance of the individual or individuals within the relevant historic context, demonstrate the strength of the association between the person and the site. And under criteria C, criterion, sorry, you would first identify the distinctive characteristics of the type, period, method of construction, master or high artistic value, then discuss the importance of the property given the historic context relative to the property and the applicability of criterion C. Then evaluate how strongly the property illustrates the distinctive characteristics of the type, period, or method of construction, master or craftsman, or the high artistic value of the property. And then I just refer you back to the last 
uh, question 29 for the five steps in a criterion D evaluation. I have also highlighted here under significant status, uh, inventory site and national register status not assessed. Inventory site has often been used to indicate that a site is not eligible or is recommended not eligible by the preparer, uh, but that is not explicitly stated in the site form. So I encourage you to also click, it says check one. So if you can't do this with OAS, then you can't, but I would like you to indicate if it's not assessed um, by checking that box and also make clear throughout the site form if you're recommending a site not eligible or if you have not assessed the site for National Register eligibility. Under 31, for the report on the site, include the date, it could just be the year, if possible, if you can just predict the year when your report will be completed, that would be great. Um, give the title, and if you can, uh, include the SHPL file number for Section 106 projects. That's immensely helpful in this office for tracking down the uh, archaeological site form that goes with the project. And do include the author of the report. Okay, so that is the form itself. I've also included some images of maps um, just to highlight things that we need. I have invented a perfectly circular archaeological site that is not an actual site for purposes of um, demonstration here. And if you are sending us a map as part of a Section 106 review, please make sure that you're clearly illustrating the area of potential effect for the project and that you're clearly illustrating the archaeological site boundaries. Please use red to illustrate the site boundaries, the archeological site boundaries, and please use a different clearly visible color to indicate the area of potential effect. Please label your map, give the project name and the project address. Make sure you have clear location information. The legal location, street addresses are great for us. Legal location is great. GPS coordinates are wonderful. And if you are documenting a site anyway, you likely have the UTMs from the site form, and that information may be more valuable to the archaeological survey. If your map is not oriented with north at the top, make sure you have a north arrow. I'm happy to look at maps with a north arrow regardless, but it's especially important that you indicate which direction is north if it's not obvious. So this is just a, a general map. I've also included a site sketch map example, again, using my imaginary site. Um, please clearly illustrate the area of potential effect on this map as well. Make sure you're identifying the site boundaries in red. Indicate and distinguish positive and negative shovel tests and number the positive test units or shovel tests. Please illustrate and label any site features so that anyone looking at the sketch, any archaeologist looking at the sketch map can clearly say, see what's happening with the site and can use this as a reference when they're reading your site description in 23. Also include a location map. This map should be, uh, should illustrate the site location on a USGS topographic quadrangle, and the scale should print at 1 to 24,000. Make sure you don't have to outline them as I did, but make sure you can clearly see the section line boundaries, as that's how uh, sites are, that helps us to identify the location of the site. Again, clearly illustrate your area of potential effect and use red to outline the archaeological site boundaries, or it can just be a solid red polygon on this map. I also included a couple of other handouts and I'm just showing them to you here. Um, this is a recommended photo checklist for your archeological site form for my review. Uh, under the site, over, or please include site overview photos, 
photograph site features, and artifacts. And so I've just gone through each of these. Um, make sure your site overview photos illustrate the site setting and illustrate the current physical condition and relationship of site features. And definitely label all of your photos to indicate what you're illustrating and the direction your camera is facing. For site features, make sure that you have each feature in at least one photograph. Uh, make sure at least one photograph illustrating each site feature. And you can have multiple features in the same image, but the photo should be clearly labeled to identify and distinguish the features being illustrated. Um, for artifacts, if there are artifacts at the site, include at least one photo clearly illustrating a representative sample of artifacts. And if diagnostic artifacts are present at the site, include adequate photos to illustrate the diagnostic aspects of unique diagnostic artifacts. If you have any questions about this, I'm, my contact information is on that form. And then I've also included just a resource checklist for things that you can, resources you can be accessing to get more information about an archaeological site uh, that you're documenting. So these include the bulletins and fact sheets from the National Register, the OK Shippo fact sheet number 12, uh, which has not yet been updated, but I have planned updates for that, and then OK Shippo fact sheet number 16. Um, I've given the um, I've given the contact information for the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey. You absolutely need to be uh, doing background research with them ahead of your fieldwork investigations. Um, I've included our office location in case you need to review any of the records that we have in office. I've included links to our National Register interactive map, the um, uh, nomination search and the Oklahoma Landmarks Inventory, which Matt spoke about. I've included also links to the Oklahoma Historical Society's Research Center and the Gateway to Oklahoma History, um, Topo View, the BLM's GL, uh, General Land Office Records Search, which includes patent information and, uh, and maps and survey descriptions. I've included a link to Oklahoma State University's digital maps collection for Oklahoma, uh, historical soil survey maps from Alabama maps, and a large sort of uh, overall viewer uh, called Old Maps Online, which actually has access to a lot of good, useful maps. And then my contact information is here too. And that is all the information I have. So now I think uh, I want to reach out to Linda and see if she could read any questions. Okay, so Matt, both questions that are posted currently are geared towards your survey form. If the resource is not NRHP eligible, will 21 and 22 be left blank? Let me scroll to that. Oh, thank you, Christina. So as you can see here on this slide, so we had a, for the completed form, we had a uh, description of significance be not individually eligible, but we still had an area of significance indicated. Um, so yes, please indicate at least one um, area of significance, um, even if you are of the opinion or you're recommending that the property is not um, eligible. I think one thing I want to point out uh, when I was thinking about these questions is that documentation is subject as part of a specific context. We're documenting these properties at a particular time and place. New information can always uh, be uncovered. And so just because a property may not be eligible now doesn't mean it may not become eligible later for um, an area of significance that we haven't even thought about or we just didn't have the information at the time. Um, likewise, properties that we think are eligible now may become ineligible later due to any number of, of reasons. So, so yes, we do need to be thinking about um, areas of significance, you know, potentials, you know, potential associations, that type of thing. So yes, please indicate an area of significance, even if you're of the opinion that the property is not eligible. Okay, and the next question is, 
<clears throat> Just to be clear, if it is, for example, an ODOT project, should the survey field be checked yes? Or is that only for thematic SHPO surveys? To my knowledge, um, it's ODOT project is a type of cultural resources survey. Uh, it's a survey project, so that field should be checked yes. Okay, we have one more. Does a structure need to meet a certain age to qualify as historic? I assume this one's for me as well. Um, they don't say, but so, let's assume that it's for the built yeah, environment. Yeah, okay, for built environment. So for, for purposes, you know, a lot of our conversation today has been geared towards, um, you know, filling out HPRI forms, insight forms for Section 106 review. And for purposes of Section 106 review, we need um, HPRI forms completed for all, you know, for all building structures and objects that are over 45 years of age. Um, typically speaking, for National Register Register eligibility, uh, so yes, it is for a building. Um, for National Register eligibility, a, a property needs to be at least 50 years of age uh, to be, um, you know, to be considered potentially. Uh, to be put under evaluation for eligibility. But, you know, we also have National Register workshops on this. There is, uh, there can be exceptions to that. You know, properties can uh, achieve significance uh, even if they are less than 50 years of age, um, if they uh, meet the criteria for their association with events, for architecture, for significant persons, um, or for their potential to yield information. So um, just because a property is not uh, 50 years of age. Um, say if 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 someone is out there and they're curious about a particular building, um, and you know, I will I will accept forms for for purposes of preliminary opinions. I'll accept forms for buildings that are um, essentially of, of of any age. I mean, not brand new buildings, of course, but you know, if it's if you if it's within that, you know, maybe 10 years or so of the 50 year mark, you know, you can I can I would still be happy to review a form for for that particular building. Okay, there are no further questions. All right. If there are no further questions, um, I think we've we've hopefully we've we've addressed all of your um, you know questions concerns. My hope is, uh, I think our hope was for this presentation was, I know we had uh, folks in, in, the, in the audience today that many of you, I think, are, are, have filled out a ton of these types of forms uh, for, for your work. I think we had a few new people in here as well. Um, and you know, one of my hopes for this presentation was like, this is, we're, we will record, you know, this is being recorded. It'll be uploaded to our, our website and I believe to our YouTube as well. Um, so for you know, you folks that are associated with particular um, companies or agencies, you have new employees come on, uh, I hope you would direct them to this type of video. Uh, that way they can kind of get a sense of, you know, what we need for, for our reviews. And then likewise, uh, my hope is, is that this becomes useful for, um, you know, those individuals and groups who aren't as experienced with uh, the everyday rigors of, of documentation, but they, they need the information to fill out a form for a property that they're interested in. So we hope this was useful to you. And um, we look forward to seeing you uh, next time. Chris